Welcome to another Real Python Code Conversation. I'm Philip, a Real Python team member, and I'm going to have a conversation with Bartosz, who is another Real Python team member. This code conversation is a bit different to other Real Python code conversations you might have seen. The emphasis this time is more on the conversation part. Bartosz will take you on an Easter egg hunt. You'll learn about the history of software development and some hidden gems in Python. However, there won't be that many code examples, so you can treat this code conversation a bit like a podcast episode. Lean back and listen to the interesting things that Bartosz has to say. Enjoy! When we're talking about Easter eggs, what are we actually talking about? What has this to do with software development and why is this an interesting topic to talk about? Yeah, in the traditional sense, for those of you who don't know, Easter eggs are hard-boiled eggs, which are decorated in various patterns and paints. But they also mean something entirely different in the software engineering, particularly video games. And this is exactly what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, I remember this from my childhood. Like We actually had Easter egg hunts in, in Germany. So when it was Easter Sunday, our parents were hiding uh, Easter eggs in the garden and we, we kids had to wait inside. And then you went outside with a little basket and all the kids needed to find Easter eggs. And in the end, you were comparing who found the most and who found the most interesting ones. Often there were not only boring boiled eggs, but chocolate eggs, which is a bit more interesting. Oh, yeah. Especially as a kid, right? Still as an adult, I guess. Yeah, and you were mentioning in software development, there is something similar. There are also little interesting details that are hidden somewhere in video games, software, sometimes even films, and also in Python. But maybe before we go into the Python world, do you know of any popular Easter eggs or some examples that our viewers might already know? Absolutely. But before we do this, I would actually like to go take a step back and explain a little more about the concept of Easter eggs in software. Like you mentioned, there was this game called the Egg Hunt game. And it's a very similar concept in programming. So it's like a little game for people to entertain themselves and find some jokes and hidden secrets in software. It's mostly about this Egg Hunt game, which is funny because I live in Poland and Easter is huge in Poland, but I've never heard of Egg Hunt game in my life before. I literally asked my wife and she said, oh yeah, sure, I know what that is, you know, from TV. But in our childhood, <laughs> we never played that game. So I was really curious to find out what it is all about. And it turns out that, yeah, parents just hide those eggs somewhere and the kids are after them. And the idea with Easter eggs in software is kind of similar where the developers, the original creators, put these secret messages, jokes, hidden something in the software, and they don't tell anyone about it. Mm -hmm. They just wait until someone discovers it and that becomes popular. There are many examples in software that you might be aware of. So for instance, if you're using a web browser, which is based on the open source Chromium project, like Google Chrome or the recent Brave browser, you have to be offline to experience this. So when there's no internet access and you go somewhere, it displays this little dinosaur along with a boring message that there's no internet, which is, of course, quite familiar. And do you know why they put this T-Rex dinosaur there? I was always wondering. I, I thought it was maybe because Mozilla or something like that and having a dinosaur there. Yeah, I was scratching my head once too. And... <laughs> Apparently, it was an inside joke and they wanted to refer to the prehistoric times where there was no internet. So <laughs> when you have no internet access, they show this little dinosaur to emphasize that it's like living in the prehistoric times these days without internet anymore. That makes total sense. And I mean, this alone already is kind of like a little Easter egg because it's probably a joke that developers had. But I guess there is a bit more to this dinosaur as well. It's not just an image that's showing there. Yeah, you're quite right. When you hit a spacebar or your up arrow key on the keyboard, you can actually start playing the dinosaur. So it starts this little game inside your browser to entertain yourself while there's no internet. <laughs> <laughs> and you can jump, you can crouch to avoid the enemies and obstacles and score points. So there's a little hidden game, which you might have not known before. And this is a great example of an Easter egg in your web browsers. So... 
Easter eggs are super popular in video games. That's the probably the biggest type of software where you would go and find those Easter eggs. Mm. But that's not the rule. There are some professional software applications which also include Easter eggs. Perhaps one of the most famous ones was Microsoft Excel. They featured a whole flight simulator that which is crazy inside Excel. So you would type some cryptic message into a cell and then you would use a particular key combination and it would open up this flight simulator right in your Excel, which is quite funny given, you know, Excel is considered professional software for business applications and yet you can play a game inside of it. That is so funny. I didn't know about this one. And I mean, it's like you can pretend to work on big numbers, but actually you're playing flight simulator. That's quite cool. Yeah. But they they changed their take on Easter eggs. I mean, Microsoft. And at some point they decided that, you know, they want to become a serious company and they removed all the Easter eggs from their software. Mm, At least that's what they're saying. So you won't find this flight simulator in Excel anymore, unfortunately. Unlike other companies, like Google, for instance, is still pretty big on Easter eggs. If you go to a Wikipedia article that lists all the Easter eggs in Google products and services, it's a a pretty long list. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's a good example of developers also having fun and not just publishing the corporate software, but also leaving some like maybe little bugs in that are not harmful or, or something like this. And maybe Microsoft only wants you to think that there are no Easter eggs. So if any viewers find some Easter eggs in a Microsoft product, let us know in the comments below, because maybe they are still out there. Do you know one of the first appearances of, of an Easter egg in software development? I know. I checked the Wikipedia before recording this. <laughs> so that's how I know. Apparently, perhaps the first Easter egg in software known to humanity is from early 1980s from a video game. And Atari didn't want to credit their developers and they, they wouldn't show the names of developers who were working on the game for different reasons. One of them was because they didn't want other companies to go after their developers. And there was one programmer who didn't like this. He really wanted to be credited. He wanted his work to be acknowledged for his efforts. Of course. He secretly put his name in the game without telling his bosses. So the player would have to do something specific in the game to find that secret room or something where it would display the the name of the developer. And that's how the concept of Easter egg was created. Initially, the company decided to remove it. They didn't like it, but, you know, it wasn't the internet times yet. So they would have to release a new version without that Easter egg. But that proved to be too costly. So they decided to keep it. And actually, they they liked it because, you know, the players also enjoyed looking after those uh, Easter eggs. So that's how it all started. And one cool thing is that you as a Python programmer, and with you, I mean you as a viewer, but also you, Bartosz, <laughs> can still find some Easter eggs in Python. Python is one of the places where you can go on an Easter egg hunt. And that's something that we want to do today and find some Easter eggs in Python. That's right. Any journey as a programmer, we often start with uh, Hello World programs. And there are some things that we can actually uncover in Python. But before we go to the Easter eggs, how does like a typical Hello World program look in Python? Well, in Python, it's pretty straightforward. You just call the print function, open parentheses, and inside you put a string which says, Hello World exclamation mark and it prints the string hello world but uh, it's interesting that you're asking specifically about the hello world implementation in python because writing hello world in python is fairly straightforward but if you ask me how to write hello world in java i'm not sure if i would be able to do this at the first try probably it would take maybe two because of the complicated syntax That is true, but there is even a way on how to get a Hello World message in Python without even writing code, right? 
Yeah, Philip, you're right. It turns out there's an even simpler way to implement Hello World in Python, which doesn't even include writing a single line of code because Python comes with Hello World built in. So you can actually run a module that is in Python standard library. Mm -hmm. And to run a Python module, you type the Python command, whoops, Python, and then you supply the dash M option, which stands for module. And then you just specify the name of the module. And it's interesting because you won't find it in the official documentation, if I recall correctly. But if you look at the source code, there is a funny looking module name, which is called double underscore hello, double underscore. Or using Python's lingo, the double underscore is often abbreviated to dunder. So it's dunder, hello, dunder. And if I hit enter, it will, well, print the hello world. So someone already has implemented hello world for us in Python. The dunder hello module is a perfect example of an Easter egg because it's concealed. If you go to the official Python documentation, you won't be able to find it. For example, if you navigate to the docs.python.org and type dunder hello, it won't show up because even though it's in Python, it's not documented on purpose. Mm -hmm. But since you're running Python locally, you can find that file and view its source code. You could also go to see Python source code on GitHub and look it up there. But um, probably the quickest way would be to use something like bpython, which is a cool little wrapper around the standard Python REPL or read evaluate print loop. And when you import something like Thunder Hello, and then you use a keyboard shortcut under your cursor, I think it's the default one is F2, it will show you the source code. In here, we can see we have some variable called initialized, we have a few classes and the main function. And it turns out that these few classes aren't completely useless because they're actually used in the unit tests in Python, if I recall correctly. Mm -hmm. So this module isn't just an Easter egg, it's actually being used by the unit tests in Python. And then we have the main function, which is the entry point to that module, which means that when you run this module, the way I showed it before, using python-m option, it will run the main function in here and it will print the hello world text on the screen. 